We praise God for their musical gifts and talents and voices. Indeed, as they just sang, God works all things together for the good of those who love God and are the called according to God's purposes. So we thank God that it's all good, ultimately. I want to lift up as a subject this morning, love anyhow. Love anyhow. Can you say that with me? Love anyhow. Dear God, we thank you for this moment, which is pregnant with all kinds of possibilities. We thank you for the life-giving power of your word. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight. God, you are our strength and you are our holy redeemer. This we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love anyhow. Love anyhow. Love anyhow. This past week, my attention was arrested as I was driving to the church to begin my day, and I heard a song on Christian radio. And it's a song that really caught my attention because it's catchy and it has a hip hop flavor. It is a song written and uh, executed by gospel artist Ty Tribbett, and it's entitled Anyhow. Anyhow, you might want to Google that song, Anyhow. And in it, he says, and I quote, we are fighting in this daily war. Satan tries to conquer our souls through pain, through fear, through stress, through storms. The battle rages on and on. Your promises, God, are yes and amen. I believe you will do just what you said. However, later in the song, he writes, hit keeps coming after hit. Got me thinking maybe this is it. Got this war going on in my mind, trying to make me think my faith is counterfeit. And then at the zenith point of the song, Tribbett exclaims, certain days it feels like my faith is running low, but it is a mustard seed, so I must believe in what I sow. So in tears, what water will grow? Never fear, it is under control. Storm is here, but I'm asleep in the boat. And at the conclusion, he says, hallelujah, anyhow. Hallelujah, anyhow. This powerful song is a wonderful and sublime gospel hip hop anthem and a declaration of faith in God. A faith that is both alive and at work, even though stormy winds are threatening to sink our lives. It is a faith that Tribbett testifies that he has anyhow. Obviously, Bible students know that his song is based on a familiar event that the disciples experienced with Jesus in a boat out on a storm-tossed sea in the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. Jesus is asleep on that boat. It's a boat battered by the waves and winds of a storm. But he has peace because Jesus always walked in the tranquility of God. Even though the storms were often raging in his ministry, Jesus knew how to walk in God's tranquility. Using this account from Mark 4 as a springboard for his own testimony, Ty Tribbett does exactly what we should do as we read the scriptures. Ty Tribbett imagines being in that sea, imagines being in that boat himself as he thinks about the storms he has faced in his own life, and he concludes that by God's grace, he has the peace required to fall asleep as Jesus did. When life storms begin to rage and consequently at the end of it all, his faith will offer up to the Lord a hallelujah anyhow. <clears throat> anyhow faith, as I coin it, represents a level of holy defiance and it leads to an anyhow praise. And it communicates to the watching world that even though I should not want to praise God because of my situation being so bleak and because my situation seems so messed up right now, 
I'm going to defy my own emotions because I've got faith and I'm going to buck what I feel emotionally and I'm going to praise God anyhow. And anyhow is a sweet little adverb. And in this context, it means by any means and despite what is going on around me and even inside of me, I'm going to praise God anyhow. And as we spent our time together last week, we talked in detail about how praise and worship are great things that we need to do anyhow. In fact, two of the best things we can do when we face trouble is praise God and worship God when the storms of life are raging and we find ourselves all cried out and even all prayed out like David found himself in the town of Zidlag. You all remember the sermon, don't you? And despite the difficulties and the depression, which are present, sometimes present, despite the daggers and the danger, which are threatening, we offer up to God a defiant faith, which shouts to God, hallelujah, anyhow. Now, now that was last week. Quite frankly, that was the gist of last week's message. And we're not necessarily focusing on the exact same thing today. We're, we're, we're looking at something else today. However, today there is a similar theme, a general theme, with a different focus, there is another anyhow kind of defiance that we are called to offer up to God as our reasonable service in the presence of difficult circumstances and especially, especially difficult people. There is another equally important dimension of the Christian faith which demands us to put into practice something that goes against the grain, something that goes against our conventional wisdom, wisdom related to this world system and against our own emotions and the negative experiences we have locked away in the vault of our memories and souls which scream out from behind the locked doors of our minds. You must be crazy to do what you're about to do given what they have done to you. You better write them off. You better do to them what they did to you. So our focus today is not about hallelujahs anyhow, but about learning to love those whom we perceive to be difficult people anyhow. And this requires us to resist and divide the temptation to hate when hate and shade are FedExed our way. It requires us to resist the temptation to hit back to clap back, to hate back when we feel we have been hit or hated. Sisters and brothers of Calvary and our guests, God has enrolled us in the school of life and we are in a section of it called the church and we are in it to learn how to love anyhow. There's that wonderful little adverb again which means by any means necessary and or to do in spite of less than ideal circumstances and conditions. Loving anyhow, let's think about that. Loving anyhow, loving anyhow. Loving anyhow is about learning to love people we deem difficult to love. Sometimes we meet very problematic people neurotic people, selfish people, sinful people, and sometimes our perceptions are what give us that information because sometimes our perceptions of other people can be way off and we have judged someone difficult to love because we have a plank in our own eyes or because we do not really know their backstories. Learning to love anyhow is about learning to love others because God has loved you and touched your life and touched our lives when we weren't particularly smelling like roses ourselves. Now, now I want to say up front and early that loving anyhow does not mean that we must hang out every day with the persons whom we are called to love. We might not ever feel the warm fuzzies around a person with whom we struggle to love, but it means we are committed to flowing and showing love nonetheless because God expects it so. Even though in your eyes, they may seem to be as wrong as a new box of two left shoes, as wrong as blossoms in the winter and hibernation in the summer, 
as wrong as Donald Trump ever becoming president again. Okay, you get the picture. You get the picture. <laughs> Putting yeah. into practice the ethic of loving anyhow is a spiritual discipline that sets apart mature Christians from immature Christians. And some would even dare say it sets apart real Christians from counterfeit Christians. This was the main thrust of what John was sharing with his first century audience. He is writing to members of the young Christian movement toward the end of the first century. For many centuries, the author of our text was thought to be the Apostle John, the same author of the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, and the Book of Revelation. More traditional biblical scholars and preachers still believe this, and I'm okay with that. Other more liberal and progressive scholars have called this premise about authorship into question in recent years, but there, where there is general agreement is around the purposes for John's writing of this particular letter. John was led by God to encourage early Christians to know the difference between true faith in Christ versus a perverted form of Christianity, all of which were beginning, many of which were beginning to pop up everywhere toward the end of the first century, all the way through the fourth century and beyond. As he composes this letter, the first of three epistles, a false and phony faith was growing was a growing problem for the church and in its most cancerous form it showed up as a false doctrine called gnosticism can you say that with me gnosticism gnosticism was a heresy a theology which emphasized attaining secret knowledge as the key for one's spirituality and salvation though it was all in Jesus name it was an esoteric and twisted understanding of the Christian faith rooted in mysticism and Greek mythology. It was practiced by the intellectual elites of John's day who were not really trying to follow the Lord. With this letter, John is trying to address that movement. He's addressing the heresy of Gnosticism. What did the Gnostics believe, preacher? Thank you for asking. They believed that Jesus never really came in the flesh. He just appeared to be human, but was in all actuality a phantom of some kind because anything that is physical they deemed, anything is physical they judged is something evil and is unredeemable. Therefore, we might as well forget trying to live holy and moral lives. We might as well visit all of the clubs and sex trafficking dens of the pagan Roman world because we are, after all, only material beings. And, and along with living raggedy lives, the Gnostics taught that it wasn't God's love and grace that necessarily saves us. What saves us is learning these mystical beliefs. That's what saves you. Your knowledge, your gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, which was the Greek word for a particular kind of knowledge and understanding, gnosis. It's your gnosis, your knowledge about the spiritual realm that saves you, not love. Therefore, true love was not at the center of their moral or ethical lives. So John writes this letter to combat these untruths and set the record straight as a quick Germain footnote, we need to realize that whatever is being taught in the church or outside of the church, which de-emphasizes God's holy love and living morally right as a holy people set apart vessels for God is the twisting of our faith. John is pushing back against this false religion that didn't believe that Jesus was fully human and that didn't exalt love and living moral and ethical lives as a chief aim. This is why in the very first chapter of first John, check it out yourself. First chapter, chapter one of first John, John begins this letter by declaring that as the disciples enjoyed their earthly relationship with Jesus, they weren't dealing with a phantom or a ghost. He writes, we declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, 
and what we have handled with our hands. We touched the master and he touched us. I laid my head upon his breast and I heard his divine heart beating. He was real. And so that's how he began. We have handled the word of life with our very hands. And then closer to our text in chapter three, beginning at verse 11, John writes about the only knowledge, the only gnosis that really counts. It is what we know about God's love and our love for others. He writes, for this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Verse 12, we must not be like Cain who hated his brother and killed his brother. Verse 14, we have passed from life to death because we love one another. Verse 15, all who hate a brother or sister are murderers. And you know that murderers do not have eternal life abiding in them. Oh, sisters and brothers of Calvary and beyond, John knew that hate leads to murder. Now, we might not ever pull a trigger or wield a knife, but we can easily shoot down someone's character and reputation with words, with gossip, with innuendo. We can very easily cut someone down with our tongues or stab someone in the back as we talk behind their backs. And then here again, what he says in verse 16, he makes it very clear that the only knowledge we should base our lives on is the knowledge of how much God loves us, which then gives us the responsibility to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. He writes, we know, we know, or we understand love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Love is the message here. And what John is talking about is not any kind of love. It is a particular expression of love that is divine. It was primarily showcased in what Jesus did when he didn't have to do it. Because we must never forget that before Jesus came to earth on what seemed to be an impossible mission, the angels were singing his praises for eternity. And the triune God was living and enthroned in perfect and supreme power. But he came here to die so that we might live. And it cost him to show this special quality of love. It cost him his, 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 uh, his, his divine connection as being a part of the triune God. It cost him living in perfect serenity as part of the Godhead. This love is not just about cards and candy and chocolates, but it is a sacrificial love as an action and in its essence. God is also calling us. He's not, God is not letting us off the hook. God is calling us to love anyhow, but not to love any old kind of way. You hear the distinction? Because this is point number one. God has called us to love anyhow, but to love anyhow does not mean loving any old kind of way. Our love offered should be a particular kind of love as Christians. The love we share should not be superficial, nor should it be self-centered. The love we have been called to give is the kind of love that Jesus expressed as he walked among us, as he blessed others with healing, as he blessed others with hope, with truth, with deliverance, with miracle provisions, even when he was tired, even when he was frustrated, even when he looked to the heavens and said, God, how long do I have to bear with them? Even when he was disappointed with people, he showed us an agape love, an unconditional love, a self-sacrificial love that is willing to show up in real life, in real time, in the nitty grittiness of life, when, 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 when our arguments happen, where disagreements make things testy, where hurtful words and deeds have been spoken and performed. Think about it. Jesus was talked about. Jesus was maligned. Jesus, the Lord of the heavens and the earth, was laughed at on several occasions. The religious establishment tried to trap him and trip him up at every turn. 
Three years into his ministry, the church leaders and the top theologians of the area and the priests were trying to figure out how to bump Jesus off as soon as possible. And beyond the Lord, there has been a long list of good people who have gotten treated horribly wrong for no good reason. John, the very author of our text, was talked about and then banished to a prison island called Patmos for doing good. Gandhi was talked about and persecuted. Mother Teresa, Dr. King, Fannie Lou Hamer, Barack and Michelle Obama were lied on, criticized, and plotted against many, many times without good justification. And so have you. And so have I too. Welcome to the world as it is. And yet we are called to love anyhow, but not anyway. This anyhow love that we are called to extend to others is a love that remains open to blessing those who have seemingly cursed you. And admittedly, it is often not easy to release to someone else, especially when our emotions are still raw from the offense. But whenever this kind of love is expressed, a sacrifice is made. We give up something. We give up our pride, our own right to be mad into perpetuity. We give up our bitternesses, our plots of revenge, because Christians realize that such emotions will eventually shrivel you and your relationships up in a stale, hot air of bitterness, which kills life. Someone prophetically said that every box of raisins is a tragic tale of grapes that could have been sweet, expensive wine. <laughs> now, I'm not hating on, on raisins, but there is a message here. We should want our lives to be an extension of God's sweet, calming presence in someone else's life. We don't want our lives to shrivel up in bitterness like like raisins or prunes. We are called to extend a love that requires dying to oneself. And, and to be clear, and I've got to be clear given the times that we're living in, I'm not talking about submitting to abuse or physical harm or repeated and unrelenting psychological violence against you. No, no, no. That needs to be reported. That needs to be left. But we can love and remain open to doing good for others, even those who seem to want to curse us, even if we have to love from a distance. Secondly, secondly, loving anyhow is so special that we need the Spirit's help to love others like this. We need the Holy Spirit's intervention to be at work in our lives to love like this. Because as was the case in John's day in which people had to deal with the oppressive and brutal reality of the Roman Empire, a Roman Empire which perpetuated violence against those who were deemed to be a threat, we too live in a world that seems to be growing increasingly cold, brutal, violent, and hateful by the minute, by the minute. And it is in this context that we need help. We need help to love others anyhow. Can I confess this morning? They say confession is good for the soul. I need help to love others anyhow. When I see people wanting to hurt children, I need help. When I see white supremacy and what it has done to our people and to other non-whites, I need help. When I see how women are treated by male chauvinists because they are not respected in certain circles as much as men, I need help. Conversely, when I see how some bitter women pigeonhole and denigrate and dog all men, I need help. Because given the shape of our world, we cannot adequately and consistently love as we should without help from the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. Jesus said that the days were coming after his ascension to heaven and after various trials and tribulations would unfold upon the earth, that lawlessness would become prevalent and the love of many would wax Cold. Given the level of lawlessness we see in our society, in politics, in business, in social and religious circles, given the craziness we have seen with the let's make America great or let's make America racist again movement, 
Given how we see people willing to jeopardize the health of millions in our society during this pandemic for the purposes of serving the almighty dollar, most of the Lansing and, and upstate uproar against Governor Whitmer and against scientific-based safety measures is rooted in putting money over people and capitalism, a rapacious capitalism, over compassion. Yes. Given what we have seen with this unholy parade of police persons killing unarmed Blacks, some who have had their hands up, some who have been running in the opposite direction, the love of many is growing cold. And we need help to love in these hateful conditions. Hence, the Spirit of God has been given to Christians as a gift living on the inside of us to empower us to be who we are called to be in times like these anyway. God gives us God's spirit to give us the strength to love as Dr. King titled his book of sermons. And in one of them describes the challenge of loving folks who seem to be unlovable. The strength to love comes from the Holy Spirit of the living God. The Spirit is an authentic person. The very presence and person of God assigned to live inside of us. And when we find ourselves overwhelmed by human pathology, when we find ourselves too hurt to forgive, when we find us, have you ever been too hurt to forgive? When we find ourselves too jaded to give another chance to anyone or to even give a care, when we find this kind of attitude welling up in our souls, the power of the Holy Spirit can help us to see things differently because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, spirit of truth. The spirit of truth reminds us through God's word that we have to forgive and then we'll be forgiven. Or do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Or do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, which you have from God. Or do not backbite or bitterly complain about someone over and over again unless you consume one another. We cannot love anyhow without help from the spirit of truth. You know, sometimes we can have the facts of a situation in our relationships, but lack the truth. The facts are not always commiserate. It's not always tantamount to the truth. You can have facts, but not have the entire truth of a situation. Howard Thurman tells the story about a man who was being unreasonably <coughs> irritable on a train. A young child was sitting in front of this man and was trying to get his attention just like Children do. He was making noises. He was being kind of annoying, but that's what children do. Suddenly, without warning, the man yelled out angrily at the child and his mother and said, would you please stop him from making all of this ruckus and have him to get away from me? And at the next stop, many people got off that train, including the mother and that child thinking very ill of that man. But Thurman said that he remained on the train because his stop had not come yet. And he was sitting in close proximity enough to hear the, young, the man muttering to himself about a splitting headache that he couldn't shake for the last 24 hours. And he even muttered that he was feeling kind of bad some kind of way because he had acted out of his own character. The fact was that he yelled at a playful little boy. The truth was the man had some extenuating circumstances that had impacted his behavior in that moment. People got off that train with the facts, but not the truth. The Holy Spirit can give us the truth about any relationship dynamic you're in. It might not come when you want it, but that truth will always be right on time. Stay in God's word and he will reveal to you the truth of whatever's causing the friction in your relationship. Third and final, third and final. According to 1 John 3, to love anyhow means that our love must go beyond theory and sermons like this sermon and Bible studies and good stories. And it must become action. It, it must become action. Cicero, that Greek philosopher and that expert in rhetoric taught that a good speech must be persuasive. And to be persuasive, it must be informative. And along with providing information, 
It's got to be pleasurable to the ear. It must be eloquent. That's what Cicero said. But he then said, none of those are the main purpose of the speech. Sharing information, good. We need information. Sharing it in a way that's eloquent, that's wonderful. But the main purpose for sermons and speeches, according to Cicero, was to persuade the listener to move toward action. And as I close, this is what John and the Holy Spirit emphasize in our selected scriptures. They emphasize that loving any, anyhow involves more than theoretically asking the Holy Spirit to empower us to love. Because love will die on the shoreline of our imaginations if we do not put it into action. Calvary, Calvary Church, loving anyhow involves stepping out of the shaky, out on the shaky tree limbs of our relationships and putting this love into action and believing that God's going to keep everything held up. John makes the point by raising a question in verse 17. How does God's love really abide in anyone who has this world's good, has plenty of blessings and sees a sibling in need? and yet refuses to actually do the action of assisting, and they refuse to act. Then he tells us, little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Oh, that's where the rubber meets the road. There it is, truth and action, theory and practice. The good Samaritan is a great example. He was despised and hated on by the Jews. And the Samaritans in turn and in general felt some kind of way about the Jews. But when he saw a man injured and hurting on that Jericho road, he didn't stop to check whether or not he was a Jewish or Samaritan who had been injured on the road. Instead, he chose to put his love into action. He was willing to become uncomfortable, took a risk and extended compassionate help that cost him some money. He put the boy up in a major hotel in the city, expressing this kind of love, anyhow kind of love, is about taking concrete steps to smooth things over with the people who may irritate us. It means extending an olive branch when bridges seem to be burned. It, it means offering authentic compliments when appropriate to someone who sometimes infuriates you or puzzles you. Don't be petty. Don't be a hater. Show some love. If those who act like your enemy come into a blessing, congratulate and celebrate for Jesus' sake. Send a car. Send a bottle of non-alcoholic or non-alcohol champagne. Look them in the eye, not toward the ground or at the wall, and tell them, I am marveling at what the Lord is doing in your life. They don't have to know all the reasons why you're marveling. And going beyond words, as John advises, if God has blessed you to be a blessing, John says, don't ignore that person's situation. Even if they seemed indifferent to your situation, don't act like you don't see the need in their life. And if you've got it like that, offer those persons some anyhow kind of love. Offer to listen if you can't offer anything else. Offer to contribute to the fund, whatever the fund is. Offer to fit the bill if you can. Seek to make a tangible difference in that difficult person's life. And your reward will be great in heaven. And not only will it pay off in heaven, but it can pay dividends down here on earth. It can turn an endless war between you and them into sweet reconciliation. It can turn a tense moment at home, at work, and in the church house into a slice of heaven and on earth. So you don't see eye to eye with someone? Love them anyway. You don't think what happened to you was fair? Go tell the person responsible for your injury if you can. And with the Spirit's help, love them anyway. Someone abandoned you and left you in the dust at the worst time? Love them anyhow. Someone you trusted broke that trust? Forgive them anyhow. Keep your eyes open. Even tell them where you stand, which might be at least 20 feet away from them. But as you heal, love them anyhow. Because as Dr. King said, love is the only force that can turn an enemy into a friend. He said that no one should cause you to stoop so low as to cause you to hate them. He said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. 
How did he know these truths, you ask? He didn't get it from his PhD in personalism at Boston University. It wasn't what he learned at Crozier Theological Divinity School. It wasn't because of his Morehouse education. It wasn't even because he was a member and a preacher in God's church. His mother and father, good people, might have shared these truths with him, but he only knew it because he had a connection with Jesus Christ. And when we are connected with Jesus, we shall know the truth and the truth shall make us free. Those who have been worshiping with us this morning, are you connected with Jesus? He can turn your sin into salvation and your bitter past into love anyhow as a lifestyle because he's about that life. He's loved you anyhow. Despite our deception, despite our selfishness, despite our waywardness, despite our callousness, despite the times we've gossiped when we should have, he climbed a hill called Calvary and hung between a sorrowful heaven and a sinning earth. And before the resurrection, he proved like none other that God loves us anyhow.